in a not too distant future, 2017 AD. There was a bunch of dirtbag guys, not too different from you or me. They worked at the Podcast Institute, tweeting shit all day in a rank track suit. They did a good job doing irony, but their bosses didn't like them, so they made them do misogyny. We'll send them <laughs> shitty writing. The worst we can find. La la la. 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 They'll have to keep on reading them and they'll slowly lose their minds. La la la. Now keep in mind they can't control where the zone begins or ends. La la la. Because we all just live there now, which is hard to comprehend. Drop a roll call. Will. Amber. Hi, girl. Felix. Felix. <laughs> Matt. Matt. Last guy. Virgil. <laughs> if you're wondering how Chapo makes money despite its lack of class, then repeat to yourself, it's just a show. I should really just relax for Chapo Trap House Theater 3000. Brown. <laughs> Listening to the Chapo Morning Zoo crew, John McCain, official memorial hour, hour, hour. The senator from Arizona is dead, and we're gonna be, <laughs> we're gonna be counting down all his greatest hits, starting with a rock block smash of four Led Zeppelin songs in a row, beginning with immigrant song. Build the damn fence. John McCain, 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 the greatest senator in American history, history, history. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. His brain died, died, died. He's in heaven, heaven, heaven now, now, now. Here are some of the people he will meet. He's in a car with Ryan Dunn right now. They're driving around heaven. I won't tell you how that ends. Oh, my God. He's getting into another car with Paul Walker, Walker, Walker. It's the seven people you'll meet in heaven. John McCain is one, one, one of them. They already subscribed to the show. We don't have to keep hustling. Call in and say the phrase. Keep slathering on that makeup. You look like a trollop, you cunt. Win tickets for one. <laughs> The way I feel about this is like I, I go back to like when I, we were talking about uh, the Corbyn stuff in the UK and again like the just mind-numbing inanity and just unreality of the fact that like everyone now, everyone has just agreed that like he's an anti-Semite and like that's the mm-hmm. thing you have to deal with. And what I said to our you know British listeners and supporters is like, look, you can either support Corbyn and be called an anti-Semite and just like deal with that, forget about it, write it off and keep going like you would otherwise or you can knuckle under it. But like, you know, either way, like just toughen up if, you, if you're in it for the long haul. Yeah. And what I'll say about, you know, with Sanders this time around is like you can be positive and only talk about the things you like about Sanders. You can engage critically with, uh, the, you know, his political rivals or opponents or, or critics in the media. But guess what? Like you're going to be treated the same way. And guess what? If you're not a white guy, you're going to be in still support Sanders. You're going to be treated even worse. <laughs> so it's like, you're just going to have to deal with well, it. I, just find, suck, I mean, like, I just find it uh, very suspicious, the motivations of all of these people who will prevaricate in order to smear someone running to be the first Jewish president of the United States. I think that's a milestone that we should all hope for and we should all support. There you go. But here's the other thing, though. And I guess like if you're looking to engage on this issue, like I, I can't like if you supported Sanders in 2016, or consider yourself left of liberal and like or progressive or even just liberal in any way. How could you, in a in a very much still ongoing primary, possibly choose Warren over Sanders? Look, I've already made my piece to the prospect of like voting for her in the general, and that's something for everyone else. No matter who the candidate is, is going to have to a decision that they have to come to on yourself based on your own moral calculus. This is like this reminds me of like 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 uh like like trial lawyers. If like if you're like a hotshot like defense attorney or even like a, any any like high high level litigator, will always tell you the facts of the case, the evidence of the case don't matter. When you're in front of a jury, i.e. the voters, all that matters is telling a story that's more believable than the other yeah. side. It's using I mean like facts. Yeah, they're, they're there. They have to be dealt with. But all all they are is just like stitching in like this weave, this tapestry of a story that you're selling yes. to an audience. And if you understand your audience, 
whether it be the jury or a voter, then you can get them to believe you and you can wrap them around your finger. The, like, he just seems to think if we, if all of us are, like you said, enlisted in this posting crusade where we're constantly fact-checking every single thing that gets posted on social media or that Mima or Pep Pep, you know, oh, uh, so, sorry, Gran, uh, Obama, you know, uh, do, you know, I don't know, wasn't born in Kenya or whatever, and here's X, Y, or Z bullet points to tell you why or what. It doesn't matter. The story about Obama being a foreigner is a story she believes because it's a story that makes sense to her. Yeah. It makes sense to her because it describes to her what she's feeling. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. What she's feeling is that Obama is different from her, he's foreign in some way, and that he is a, a threat to what is familiar and known to mm -hmm. her. Yeah, you can't you can't convince that person otherwise. What you have to do is tell a better story. Yes, and and, and tell a story that, frank, quite frankly, excludes these fucking apes. But <laughs> yes, well, they're that. I mean, everything in this just shows that the game they're playing is trying to narrow cast technocratic solutions that appeal to essentially urban professionals, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then the, the 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 base that just sort of votes Democrat no matter what. And, and this just shows you that that is a futile enterprise because every fucking solution is, well, we'll just tell the truth better and we're going to have a website. And it's like, we know none of this works because you're narrow casting to just not enough people, not enough people to do the kind of, of to, to, to create a durable majority. You have to tell a simple, effective story where you have an enemy and you have exactly. solutions. Exactly. And then you increase hypothetically, maybe not, but it's honestly our only fucking hope. This isn't going to work. With that, you increase the fucking number of people who are willing to vote. But it has you. to be factually bulletproof. No, it has, <laughs> it's, like, it's like the OJ trial. Like, if your client very clearly murdered someone, <laughs> you create a story where there is another person who yes. could have done it, or you create all these questions. Or it's about, the LAPD is yeah, the bad guy. Yeah, the LAPD. Or it, you create a realness, realistic enough story based on actual facts, like, yeah. for instance, that the LAPD is a ludicrously corrupt and racist uh, organization. Yes. But, however, you're exactly right, Matt. You need an enemy. Mm -hmm. Every story needs a villain. Yes. And these people, they don't understand. They, don't, they think there are no villains. They think there are just, like, good and bad arguments. Yeah. But, like, there are good and evil people. And, the, and, the policies, bad, the, and, and policies. And policies that need to be identified, right? And forces and interests. Uh, okay, so now this is, um, I don't know if you saw this. I saw it this morning, and it was one of the funniest things I've, I've read all year. Uh, it's been a while since we've checked in on the, uh, the, uh, the war. And by the war, I mean the war on bathrooms by sickos. Oh, yes. The bathroom wars. Yes, the long night. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is comes courtesy of the National Review. It is titled "Against Gender Neutral Bathrooms." <laughs> I feel like that article's never been written before. This must be super original content right here. Oh, it it goes places. That's that's for sure. Just right off the bat, you know that that is just an unpopular opinion. Period. Because everyone looks forward to one the single occupancy gender neutral cubicle bathroom. Yeah, because you can skip the queue. Yeah, and there's also, you know, um, you know, you could do drugs in there. Yeah, right. I was oh, say, and that, yeah, yeah. Right. No, yeah, right. As opposed to like, oh, uh, here's a place with just a, a row of urinals oh, right. or something. It's like, <laughs> yeah. right, what like am I going to do yeah, here? Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, so this is against gender-neutral bathrooms. This is in the pages of the National Review by someone named Madel Madeline, uh, Madeline Kearns, who is, uh, is Scottish. And you will see some of the, the Scottish stuff um, in her writing. It definitely comes through. So uh, subhead... They are pointless, wasteful, and sexist. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Galaxy brain. So he goes, uh, she begins here. I was out for lunch at a Manhattan restaurant with my friend's daughter, an exceptionally classy seven-year-old. <laughs> wow. Okay? All right, so that's the first... Already. That's the first sentence, and there's already a lot going on I here. I that. Uh, she was out Very for... Very pot at our She was that. out... For, at a Manhattan restaurant for a power lunch with a seven-year-old <laughs> who was not her child. And was her friend wasn't even with her. Oh, wait, the friend wasn't there. No, no, no. She's just, wow. I take in my friend's classy seven-year-old to lunch at a Manhattan restaurant. So her that, saying she's classy is basically a way of being like, it's okay. It's, she's not, yeah. It was basically like sex in the city. This is, yeah, exa yeah. They're having cosmos. <laughs> yeah. As you will see, they will talk about boys eventually. Uh, but uh, it was on the Upper East Side on a certain uh, block where certain <laughs> mansion resides where, like they say, uh, proper attire required. They say proper attire and child required. For uh, this is one of the negotiations that Trump talks about. <laughs> I just did a fantastic deal with a Mr. Fisher and a Mr. Price. <laughs> uh, please, may I go to the bathroom by myself, she asked. 
Yes, but no dilly-dallying, I replied, and off she went, striding briskly, blonde curls a-bouncing, straight into an all-gender bathroom. This sounds like, you guys don't have it over here, but we had these like Enid Blyton novels called like The Naughtiest Girl in the School, which is like, Enid walked down the street, her blonde curls a-bouncing, and out, po- out popped a, like, you know, something. Uh, well, just, like, weird. Well, I'm just imagining this woman, uh, you know, wa- watching this like Fauntleroy-ish uh, child go off to the bathroom and seeing the bathroom door close behind her like bobbing curls and once the woman sees the male, female, all gender sign on it, just like the Kill Bill right. sirens started going off in the background. The, her eyes turn blood red. So this is, this is great right here. Striding briskly, uh. blonde curls a bouncing straight into an all gender restroom. Oh, dear. As she entered this unlocked, lockable room. Great writing here. Wow. As she entered this unlocked, lockable room, three little boys were now in full view urinating around one toilet. <laughs> you know. Three musketeers. They're crossing swords. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is a pee-pee gang. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is piss gang this shit. Is like, this is like a, a 1910s like Coca-Cola ad where they're all wearing like uh, overalls with like one cheek hanging out the back. So he goes, now in full view, urinating around one toilet. Perturbed, if not alarmed, my young friend immediately burst back out Gave me a big wave as if to say, oops, and don't worry. She turned on her heel, disappearing around the corner. A moment passed. One by one, the heads of three naughty little boys popped out. It's just like, like one above the other, like the three <laughs> stooges looking around a corner or something. All in one big coat. Yeah. <laughs> one the well, that's how they got into yeah. the, gender, the adult gender neutral bathroom. <laughs> yes. They were wearing a long trench coat on each other's shoulders. Uh, uh, so he goes, um... One by one, uh, the heads of three naughty little boys popped out. Scheming and snickering with cat-like tread, they traced my wee pal's route. So he goes, terrifying and immediate was my arrival on the scene, scattering the would-be tormentors. What is this person's writing? Terrifying and immediate was my arrival on the scene. Yep, that is an appalling sentence structure. This is uh, this is done with like the the verbiage and style of like an A. Milne story. Yes, this is what uh, I mean. Just but about like yeah. modern gender panic. <laughs> so you guys here, uh, scattering the would be tormentors. Those boys are trying to peek on me. She said. I like that she also like the, the girl is seven years old. She doesn't describe how old the boys are. I'm assuming yeah. around the same age, which brings up, which was like, what kind of lunch is this? Is this a <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese? Or like, what the fuck? Why are there so many children in this goddamn restaurant? Well, how about the, uh, uh, the, the weakest of the arguments about, you know, coulda, woulda, shoulda, which is that, uh, you know, Sanders was uh, too mean. He was never a Democrat. And uh, you, can't, you can't run for election as a Democrat um, vowing to take over the Democratic Party or attack its leadership. And then conversely, now that he's he's out of the race, that the way to uh, enact a left agenda going forward is um, working within the party through, you know, an endorsement and voting for Joe Biden, because that will be the, the key that unlocks um, some sort of influence for the coalition that uh, he's built in the first place. I mean, I mean obviously, I, like, that's... I, I mean, like, I, I can dismiss that one because I just think that this idea that, like, Oh no no no! Like, uh, like you know, you, you know, the way to show that you have power is to vote in uh, a Biden Democratic coalition um, and like help them achieve their goals because then you'll be useful to them. I just like, I just think like the weakest possible argument is saying that the way to demonstrate power is by capitulating entirely and showing the Democratic Party that there's literally nothing that they can do that will cause you not to vote for them. And like this is where I'm, like also if you think about like the Labour Party example, right? Like them um, stabbing their own leadership and their own candidate in the back and throwing the basically throwing the election to a right wing party. I mean, it's grotesque, it's disgusting, but it does show that the people involved in this are dead fucking serious about power, their own power, and the ideolog- ideological project with which they're a part of, and that they're willing to throw an election in the short term for the sake of their broader political goals. I mean, they're well, they're willing to be rendered uh, absolutely powerless. I mean, to quote uh, the architect from The Matrix, there's a level of survival they're willing to accept, uh, <laughs> meaning that they'd be fine as a permanent minority party as long as the current 
leadership maintains control. As long as they can still fuck children, they're fine. Exactly. But as like, long as they still got those invitations to Martha's Vineyard and Little St. James. I mean, it's not like it's not totally about like, you know, their personal social life and jobs. These people are committed to a, you know, a like a neoliberal class politics that is. Yeah, which the other party will the, carry yeah. out, too. Yes, right. exactly. So That's what I mean. That's what I mean. And like, you know, like that, that it shows that like, you know, the, the ruling class is willing in like in one of their own parties to lose an election. If if it means getting rid of uh, a challenger or a wing of the party that is a threat to their ideological goal, I want to switch gears for a second and talk about like, the other the other big thing that's going on. I mean, not big thing, uh, but just the thing that um, interests and amuses me the most about uh, what's going on in the country right now, and that would be the um, totally spontaneous grassroots protest wing yes. wing to reopen. Uh, the mm -hmm. states and end the quarantine lockdown, reopen, Mich liberate mm -hmm. Michigan, liberate the states where you've got basically people showing up at state houses using like Guy Fox masks as PPE. Yeah. It's just like, you know, screaming at, at cameras about how like they're OK. Famously, there is a guy who is in tears because he couldn't buy lawn fertilizer. I got to fertilize the lawn. And he's like, he's like, well, you're, you're, you're telling us that you can't you can't buy grass seed. So yeah, literally, literally, literally weeping because he can't buy shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, there was the woman who's Never, like, I, the woman who's like, oh, I, I can't get my hair done, and like, you know, her roots are like, you know, oh no, way out roots. there. And you know, okay, I, here's what I want to say about this. I've seen like a lot of like contrarian busybodies scolding that like actually the left um shouldn't make fun of these people because they're workers or like they, you should have sympathy for these peace people. Please, what? please jack me off to completion. Like these people, owners. Are, these, these people, people are own rich businesses. assholes. They want to open them so that their employees can risk getting corona. Okay, right. E even, if, even if that weren't the case, I'm sorry. Hundreds of Americans turning out in like public to like cough and gob on each other in the middle of a pandemic to demand that like they can be able to yeah. buy shit again. I'm sorry. That's funny. And it's just indicative of like everything stupid about America. Like, I'm really, saying, there, really like awesome. there are there are no other countries where this is happening right now. Did you see the clip of this one guy? It was a nurse in scrubs doing a one man counter protest standing in front of traffic of this woman in a tank like SUV honking her his horn honking her horn at him and then like she just just crawls out of the window like some kind of fucking gargoyle to scream at him about how he should move to China if he likes communism so much and that's the guy who's probably going to be like fucking ventilating her next yes. week yes you know yes. what i mean yes. like okay. and she had a side that said free land I, free I land and i was like this is a little on the nose I do have a few questions about this because I've I haven't been reading that much into this because it's not in FT or Business Insider. Well, it's um, a made up story or, or that's TMZ. just for television. Right. It's all ginned up. It's like a couple handfuls of people. I think it's a couple handfuls of people, and I assume they're um, either knowingly or unknowingly acting on someone's behalf. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. No, it's, it's absolutely all because because I will say, I mean, there are people who are like, look, I need my fucking job back. I, I want to, like, take my chances and, you know, ease the quarantine. And I mean, there those, are like those are not concerns. these people. But those yes, are not these insane. people. But yeah. Those are yeah. one. Those are not these people. And two, where do these people come from? Because like rugged individualists tend to not be very good at organized protests. They're usually, like the Tea Party, there usually tends to be um, uh, an infrastructure behind it. Yes. Well, obviously that's the case. Yes. Like, yeah, I yeah. mean, these, 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 are, these are, these are, these are asteroids. I'm sure like the Cokes or Murphers or no, know, it's already, like, DeVos the family are already, like, yeah. are already being exposed. Yeah. To Amber's point, like there's sort of a similar thing in the UK where they, there's a bunch of like weird tw tweets from like, I don't want to say bot because that term's been just beaten into meaninglessness, but like very clearly astroturfed NHS accounts with stock photos of supposed NHS workers. All their tweets are sent from Hootsuite, which is like a mass mass tweeting tool where they're talking about how we should do her herd immunity and all this shit. And that does like I think like always this is we know what the the play for like the right wing fake populist governments of the world will be. And as always, Bolsonaro just gave it away 
quicker than everyone else because he's the dumbest <laughs> and was just walking around into huge crowds saying that he doesn't have it despite everyone he's ever known having it and <laughs> hugging and kissing him all the time. But that like that's going to be the thing is like AstroTurf protests about opening back up again. But the thing I mean, the thing that's awful is like, yeah, those are our two main options. Like you have on, on one side, you have people going, no, everyone stay locked down forever. And uh, we'll give you uh, we'll give you a rebate for 13.8 percent of your income if you went to a state school within the last five years <laughs> and you can buy Cobra for your health insurance. And maybe we can give you your, you know, fucking half of your unemployment insurance through T-bills. And then the other side just saying, open it all up. Fuck it. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the only options you're getting. Yeah. I think what's going on here and like, you know, to Amber's point, like, yes, the longer this goes on, like, you know, if you're not getting a paycheck, it's going to get to the point where like you fucking like you need an income, you need money to survive. And like the idea that you can't or aren't allowed to work is going to be a problem. And then like that decision to, you know, not observe social distance or quarantine is going to be like, you know, one that I don't, you know, will be harder to uh, scold people for for breaking. Everyone at these fucking protests, they're not demanding that they go back to work. They're no. demanding that other people go back to work for them. Yeah. Yeah. So they bring them shit, to get to, I, giving them shit. Literally yeah. said he, was, he, did, he wanted to go to the restaurant so that he could get free refills. So he didn't have yeah. to get two iced teas through the drive through. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I mean, like the, the images from the protests are like ghoulish in the in the extreme because it well, is my like favorite you know, thing about it is it's, it's the maga mom screaming in front of a baskin <laughs> robbins about like i'm giving me my 31 flavors back this is a tyranny we are going to be thinking about donald trump from every day from now until we die probably yep long after he's dead and let's be honest he will probably live to be 120 years old for sure i mean he's lived this fucking long he's definitely going to live another 30 or 40 years for oh indeed sure. Um, we're going to be thinking about him forever. And there's like, there's no escape now. I know what was his name? Michael Bennett at the Iowa State Fair. His big pitch was like, if I'm president, you won't have to think about me for weeks at a time. Just go back to sleep. You would like politics. Don't think about it. The White House, not a thing. I'll just show, I'll just pop up once a month. Be like, hey, it's the president, everybody. But he just won't like the president will like, I will. I'm so fucking boring. I will just put you to sleep. I won't be on your brain. Even if Michael Bennett became president tomorrow, we would all still be living in Donald Trump's brain. Oh, absolutely. And there is no escape. And I had this vision of myself. Like, he's already changed the way we talk. Oh, like, it for just sure. Starts out I do a, the hand gestures. It, it just starts out as a joke, but I just say now totally unron unironically things like, bye-bye. <laughs> Very mess. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you hear us getting infected with it on the show. You're, you know what? You're, you hearing are it becoming more, infected you're literally with it. hearing it more and more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, you know, politically correct automobile companies. <laughs> it's just these things are just in my many, brain. Many, many French fries. <laughs> <laughs> the, the handsome generals. So, all the greatest. The central heads. casting generals. They're like, so handsome. Uh, yeah. It's like a. It's like a you know, uh, the scene in Soylent Green where they uh, put Edward G. Robinson to, to sleep yeah. with the Soylent Green factory and they just, it's like you're on a bed and it's just showing you one of those like Time Life music collection ads, but for like Trump's greatest hits. They yep. have some generals, like, you know, all your <laughs> favorites. I'd like to be the handsome quarterback's agent. You know, uh, like uh, the chairs aren't as big as they used to be. Uh, you know, whatever. And I just had this vision of like, yeah, me on my deathbed. Surrounded by friends, family, loved ones, like you know, the the morphine is hitting. Um, you know, got one foot out the door, and I just begin to mouth something, and then you know, like maybe my beloved, you know, child, son or daughter will just be like, "What's that?" He he's saying something. I see, so they lean in. I just go, "Sissy Graydon Carter's bad food restaurant. <laughs> His Oscar party is not hot." <laughs> And that's that's as the DMT is released. That's what I'm going to be thinking about, probably. Washed up psycho pet. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really good one. Yeah. I forgot. Washed, washed up, up psycho. It's <laughs> 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 the that said that. It's <laughs> the press out of nowhere. <laughs> Washed up psycho pet Midler. <laughs> and, you know, we we're thinking about this and it's just like we, you know, are so far gone now. Like we've been talking to like 
like I said in the last episode, we are at level nine of a James Elroy novel right now, and I don't know what happens when we hit like the final chapter. When we hit level ten, I, like this all just seems like we're just we're headed to a terminus. That like it, it, we we. It seems like it's never going to come, but like we know it's out there somewhere, we and we are reached. so far gone now that like think about every previous American president during your lifetime, and like what shows like SNL have had to do to make fun of them, which is essentially pick one sort of odd mannerism or tick that they have and exaggerate it to like a ludicrous degree. Like George H. W. Bush, that was the first one I remember, not and it was Dana that. Carvey. Not gonna do it. Not gonna do it. Like just, you know. That million pints a lot, you know, and like yeah. the, it was just a sort of slightly dumb impression. Bill Clinton, he he, pers- he bit his lip, and you know he, was, uh, he, he loved uh, hamburgers. Horny and liked hamburgers. Yeah, he's a fat horny guy who's you know kind of yeah. sort of dishonest. Uh, George W. Bush, you know, strategery that was funny. Barack Obama, you know, uh, uh, he was a homosexual who eats dogs. SNL did that, right? Uh, no, they did oh. sadly not. <laughs> and he was cool, hilarious. <laughs> That's why Obama was. Oh, my God. Obama was honestly worse than Trump for SNL. I mean, just it just as a comic character, because you could tell that they like they I, they had that kind of I guess they probably had a racial anxiety. Well, yeah, they had Fred Armisen do blackface. That was like they couldn't good. Do, that's the <laughs> funny thing. They had they were willing to have fucking Fred Armisen do blackface, but they wouldn't say that he ate dog. It's like, what the <laughs> fuck, dude? Just like go all the way instead of being uh, oh he's kind of a nerd or whatever the fuck or just like you know like the the, the little the little scandals like uh, George H W Bush uh, vomiting on the Japanese prime minister that was pretty good or Lewinsky or you know any any of like the dumb little things but like just two again it seems like it's ten thousand years ago that he's been president but like just every single thing every these little moments that we've talked about or laughed about on the show we don't realize like how far we've gone down into this like hyper normalized reality of like absolute absurdity and depravity like and, and i like i i haven't fully processed it like i'm just on you know i'm going down the water slide basically uh going on now three days later the Buttigieg campaign began promoting a list of 400 south carolinian supporters of his douglas plan in emails to reporters and posts on social media the supporters were rolled out in a press release open letter published in the HBCU Times, which focuses on positive news related to historically black colleges and universities. Listed at the top of the press release were three prominent supporters, Columbia City Councilwoman Tamika Devine, Baptist pastor and state representative Ivory Thigpen, and Johnny Cord- uh, Cordero, chair of the state party's Black Caucus. There is one presidential candidate who has proven to have intentional policies designed to make a difference in the black experience, and that's Pete Buttigieg, read the open letter released along with the plan. That really sounds like an endorsement. The blowback came immediately. Devine, who had not endorsed a candidate yet in the presidential election, told The Intercept that she did not intend her support for the plan to be read as an endorsement for Buttigieg's candidacy and believes the campaign was intentionally vague about the way it was presented. Asked if she knew if any of the black supporters of the plan were also supporters of Buttigieg, she said she wasn't sure. The only ones I really know were me and Representative Thigpen, she said. I don't know many actually now to think about it other than the folks working on Mayor Pete's campaign. Thigpen, meanwhile, has endorsed Senator Bernie Sanders for president and was startled when he learned that the campaign had not only attached his name to the plan, but also listed him as one of the top three supporters atop the letter. Here is the really amazing part. The way they did this is that they sent people an email about this and said, not responding to this email will be used as evidence of your support and endorsement of Bert <laughs> oh, uh, Buttigieg. See, brilliant, brilliant. That's why I am still charged every month for my browser subscription. <laughs> the same, tra- the yeah, same no, technique. After the publication, the Buttigieg campaign said it had sent the plan to a list of supporters and asked them to opt out if they did not want their name <laughs> included on the list. The email also specifically said that the list was meant to represent over 400 black South Carolinians. And then, of course, it came out that like maybe half of them were just white people. Yeah. Uh, the Buttigieg campaign said that they have never claimed that the list was exclusively prominent black South Carolinians and that it's important to have a multiracial coalition to support the end goal of racial justice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then also 
as part of this uh, this plan, the uh, the Buttigieg campaign uses stock footage of a Kenyan woman <laughs> to represent <laughs> their support among. That's literally the Black college stock. pamphlet thing. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Okay. Oh, that's like all those guys who are on Twitter with blacks for Trump, where they just grab it off of Shutterstock. Amazing. Yeah, no, what, what I love so much about they're like, uh, please respond to opt out of this endorsement. <laughs> By reading this email, you have agreed to endorse Pete Buttigieg and his Frederick Douglass plan. Amazing. Imagine if, imagine if Bernie Sanders. Just did think that. about it, folks. Just imagine if he Just did think that. about it for a minute. Yeah. And all of, imagine all of the people who love and support Pete Buttigieg and attack Sanders all the time. Uh, what what has been their response to this? I'm not talking about it, to my understanding. But here's my favorite thing about this: the whole thing about like how the, the creating a focus group to give you an answer that you can leak to the press that like basically slanders the black community as being homophobic for not supporting you, Pete Buttigieg, and your plan to uplift you know yeah. uh, black people in America, and then being like you know by by looking at this email, you have uh, agreed to <laughs> respond to the email within an hour. If you, you know <laughs> that to me, this is all McKinsey mindset. This oh, yeah. is what he learned at McKinsey. And the other big article out about this week about Buttigieg, Pete Buttigieg is even more interesting to me because I just thought, like, okay, we saw those pictures of him in Afghanistan, like, holding a rifle and like, yeah. looking down the barrel at it. Giving, <laughs> you know, holding, like, you know, holding it the wrong way or just looking like a complete fucking prat. He was not a gun guy. As yeah, Rachel he was an says. office guy in Afghanistan. Yeah. Then yes. he was like... Well, yeah. like, it turns out, like, the bulk of what he did was economic development in war zones yeah which, hmm, yeah what does that mean okay but like and then and then he then he joined mckinsey and i remember learning about that and i was like holy shit like just joining up with one of the most evil outfits imaginable and when that first started happening people started saying that the response was oh come on like the only account he worked on was like a regional grocery chain okay well it turns out that's the reason we know about that is because everything else he did for mckinsey is covered by an nda <laughs> and what he did for them was blood curdling shit about <laughs> yes, as Felix said, promoting security and economic development in war zones. Uh -huh. If you can read that sentence and not just see CIA on it, I don't know what well, the fuck. He he went into Afghanistan and Iraq and looked for Pell Grant recipients. <laughs> <laughs> this is when they introduce Slick Willie. Oh yeah. Oh, wow. he, this is where he enters the story and they meet at law school He's and then he becomes man. being featured in the present. As an interview subject, I'll just say right off the like bat, Lady Elaine Fairchild, Bill Clinton looks like shit. He looks, <laughs> he looks not abominable. Well. And here's something else I want to notice: in the first episode, especially when every he's talking about him and Hillary's relationship, he has this thing he does where his whole hand mm -hmm. is touching his face. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's this weird, like, like Jack you know, Benny. Uh, it's like the cover of Paul Reiser's <laughs> book about fatherhood yeah. or something like that. Where he's just smiling yeah. beatifically. He's got his whole hand on covering his face. Or he, he's touching his face. And this always reminded me of uh, this rule I made for myself when I was in, in publishing. That if you look at an author photo on a book jacket and you can see the author's hands, especially if the hands are touching the person's face, you can be guaranteed 1,000% that they are full of shit. Yes. It That's is, why it's a tell. It's Thomas a tell. Friedman and Stephen March are all dying of Corona right now <laughs> yes. because they won't stop touching their face. Well, yeah, we don't know about Bill Clinton yet. Hopefully, He's, he uh, didn't, looks like didn't, he had it didn't at the stop time touching of his face. Yeah. So Bill says about like when he first started seeing Hillary around campus, he said, "I just found her magnetic," and he said, "I had just come out of a relationship, and I was thinking I would never be in a relationship again." You know, of course, you know read between the lines like I'm just going to be pulling tail and yeah. piecing he out. He also goes on to say like he never thought he would be married. Yeah. Which yeah. So and then he says That's not true either cuz like a career politician has to have like a wife and yeah. kids, yeah. yeah. So he says like well, there's just she was the she was the woman who tamed him. Uh -huh. There's just something about her that I found magnetic. And then Bill <laughs> says like one of the first times like they encountered each other like in the same room and he says quote I just couldn't bring myself to touch her on the shoulder. Which is like for not alpha, <laughs> young, jo young Joe Biden yeah. would not have hover handed young Absolutely Hillary Clinton. Not. He would have just swooped right in there and groped done, her. Done the full B Bush Angela <laughs> Merkel back rub. Yeah. Yeah. Would have took a big whiff of hair. Yeah. You know, started whispering in her ear like Joe Biden. The whole, the whole he would have sealed the deal the immediately. Back. But also, I don't believe Bill Clinton is. No, I, the truth. I don't no. believe anything Bill Clinton says. But he is. I have to say, we all have to acknowledge this. 
uh, really fun to watch. Oh, his, yeah. Some of his early footage is just like, damn, he really was slick. Well, which yep. further emphasizes that like he, you, I think he used to be a good speaker, but in this doc, oh, yeah. oh, he's he just he's just like a diminished yeah. form kind of, like of a himself. Tremor or he's, something. He yeah. drank from the wrong grail. <laughs> 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 he did. He did. So, uh, you know, Hillary describes young Bill as like the most interesting man in the world. And again, there's just something about him that was just so, he was so charismatic and intelligent, blah, blah, blah. And He's Bill a- says, um, you know, they go on, uh, they take a vacation to Europe. She'd never been there for the first time. They're walking around castles in Wales. And Bill tells her, look, I really want to marry you, but you shouldn't marry me because I'm a bad guy. <laughs> it's such a guy. fuck boy yeah, thing. Yeah. Like, basically, he was a fuck boy. But also, I feel like they're doing this weird thing where they're trying to make her sort of sound like the ingenue. Yep. And yes, like, or like a Bill, femme, femme fatale or yeah, something. Yeah, Bill was... A hill, like yeah, an actual hillbilly. Yeah, and uh, he actually had a single mother, and like this idea that Bill Clinton was worldly or something, and she was she was from the suburbs of Chicago and grew up pretty. It should have been the other way around. Well, but yeah, she, yeah. she didn't have uh, a heavy Southern accent. So yeah, we'll yeah. get to that. Not we'll yet. get to that. that. Uh, so, Will, Will, do you, as a self proclaimed bad boy, do you have do you have anything to say about that characterization? I mean, I'm just saying, like, there are good women who fall in love with you know, bad guys, but like, obviously they can't help themselves, but like maybe they should because, <laughs> you know, we're dangerous. You're a good, you're a good, you're a good <laughs> boy. You know, you're a good boy. There are heartbreakers out there. Slick, despite how intelligent, Slick Willie over here. <laughs> despite how intelligent and charismatic they may be, I'm just saying like sometimes it's bad news. Like, yeah. Sometimes you're going to get hurt. Sometimes you should settle maybe for like the quieter, shy, nice If you, guys, if, if you, you, know? if you're I'm holding my tongue. You opened it up. You opened it. You left it right there and I'm sidestepping it. I'm if he seems perfect, but guy. but then you hear him say rather instead of rather, you got oh, a dangerous, yeah. oh, a dangerous yeah. stop. Oh. oh, come on now. <laughs> Run away, lady. We're here to talk about Hillary Clinton, <laughs> not Will Menica. <laughs> uh, if Pete uh, Buttigieg can uh, say Ulysses is his favorite book, then you can definitely say Moby Dick is your favorite book. Because Absolutely. Because it... Uh, it, it's worth it and you know what I'm going to do Pete, I'm going to be like Pete Buttigieg and I'm going to be pretentious and I'm going to read now on the show right my favorite section from Moby Dick and maybe my favorite thing ever written in the English language Ooh. this is the last two paragraphs of chapter 58 Brit consider the subtleness of the sea how its most dreaded creatures glide underwater unapparent for the most part and treacherously hidden beneath the loveliest tints of azure Consider also the devilish brilliance and beauty of many of its most remorseless tribes, as the dainty embellished shape of many species of sharks. Consider once more the universal cannibalism of the sea, all whose creatures prey upon each other, carrying an eternal war since the world began. Consider all this, and then turn to this green, gentle, and most docile earth. Consider them both, the sea and the land, and do you not find a strange analogy to something in yourself? For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all the horrors of the half-known life. God keep thee, push off not from that isle, thou can never return. Woo! How about that Herman Melville, folks? Wonderful. <laughs> can, we call this, com- can we call this uh, episode Moby Dick Energy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 glad for the Hilly Joel Osment like Renaissance as well, you know, because like he he's done some good shit lately. Like on uh, yeah, he was on, he was on the Boys. He's he was on uh, What We Do in the Shadows. Yeah. and I guess like for me personally, selfishly, I'm glad for that because he is consistently the human being I'm most compared to on Twitter in terms of books. <laughs> so I suppose I can live with that now, despite the fact that you know technically his head is twice as large as mine. But <laughs> go off, he, and his he, face he, is he, half as large. As <laughs> yeah, he's, he, go off. He's a white guy with a beard and a large forehead. Hope you feel good about yourself, Twitter. <laughs> All right, so to, to sign off, you know, I mean, I, I, I could talk about like, the, the ones I didn't get to, you know, my positive squad. I've got, you know, Jim Belushi and David Crosby as like honorary potheads on Twitter. You know, Crosby's just always chuming out. Oh, yeah, he is, he is absolutely he's blazing. He, he's yeah. smoking yeah, he like, is. like he's smoking like femur sized fucking joints on on twitter he yeah will, and he's jim, rating he's rating other people's joints and being like, yeah he's horrible, rating he's rating awful. other people's roles uh jim belushi now grows marijuana like professionally in california his 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 ranch slash weed farm almost burned down you know love to him you know you know shout outs to the whole wildfire areas hope you're recovering from that 
Anthony Hopkins, wonderful. He plays the piano with his cat. Just absolutely charming. Chaos Realm, I didn't get a chance to go to Vincent Caratola, a.k.a. Johnny Sack from The Sopranos, but imagine the kind of shit Frank Stallone posts, but like even more vicious and mean without any of the positivity. <laughs> That's what Vincent Caratola's account is like. But I'm going to go out with my final celebrity shout-out that is true to who I am. I can do no else other than what I am as a pure 100% star fucker. So I'm going out with a shout out to Laura motherfucking Linney. Congratulations <laughs> on the fucking Emmy and congratulations on being a proud owner. Well, she didn't win an Emmy. She was congratulating Zendaya on winning the Emmy in the same category. I think she's won one at some point. She's, she's a wonderful yeah, she actress. Something. She's fucking great. Been great forever. But on the live Emmy broadcast from her own living room, proudly displayed the Chapo Guide to Revolution. Laura yeah. Linney, we salute you. However, in my investigations of this, I think the person we should really be shouting out here as the confirmed Chapo head is Laura Linney's unemployed fail husband. I told my family the exact same fucking thing. He fits the profile of our listeners. Married yes. to a very impressive woman. I don't think he has a Wikipedia. Seems like a great guy. Yes. That's our guy. That's our fucking that guy. Is our yes. listener. That's one yes. of our fucking yes. guys. Yeah. Yes. Because like, there, like, there's a couple things about that, and like, uh, I was so geeked when I saw that on the Emmy broadcast. Because like, the book was, wasn't just like randomly like on the coffee table. It was displayed like Prominent. it was a family photo in the shot. And Laura Linney was wearing a dress that had vote all over it, and I was like, well, yes. I don't know. Did she read the book? That seems a little. Odd. <laughs> yeah. Like everything that we yeah, we're specifically said. against that. Yeah, yeah. We hate that shit. get that out of here. <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, it just it was her. It was her wonderful husband sitting next to her, a supportive, loving, wholesome fail husband, married to a gorgeous, talented, success wife. If that doesn't and capture our listenership, I don't know what was. Laura Linney, you were an absolute queen. You can count on us. By that I mean <laughs> Chapa Trap House. Absolutely. That, you know what I love is. Like, the husband, like, I wouldn't say a fight, but, like, a mild, like, joking argument. She's like, fine, you can really, you can put your stupid shit up here. <laughs> and we are that stupid shit. <laughs> fine, put it here. Don't care. <laughs> so uh, there we yeah. go. That was, a, that was a whirlwind tour uh, through the world of celebs. And if you take our advice and follow any of these wonderful accounts, I just simply must implore you once again to look, but don't touch. Celebs, they're like they're like Ming vases, you know, just like just yeah. take in their beauty, but do not sully them, do not break them. Yeah, because because I mean, for our selfish reasons, as Felix pointed out with Dennis Leary, too much exposure and they will change the way they post, and you won't get to see the good posts anymore. And that's, folks, that's what this is really all about. Hey, 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 hey. this is Will the Mad Mad Menneker, Chapo Morning Zoo crew, crew, crew. We are broadcasting live, counting down. All your 80s, 90s, and 70s rock classics. We're broadcasting live, live, live from the migrant caravan, 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 making its way up to the U.S. border. We've just crossed into Mexico from Guatemala. And we're all here. We're partying. We're rocking and rolling. We're swishing and dishing. We've got our Soros-sponsored go bags. They're full of drugs, guns, and lawyers. We're ready. To bring this rock and roll invasion to your doorstep. ISIS is here. They're loving it. We're listening to rock. We're listening to Fog Hat. We're, we're, we're looking for jobs? No. We're looking for blood. 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 Before the midterm elections. Elections. We're registering to vote along the way. We're registering all the migrant voters coming soon to a neighborhood near you. 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 Call now to get tickets to see Jethro Tull, Tull, Tull at the Motor Speedway. Our fourth caller becomes a U.S. citizen, citizen who can vote 10 times, times, times. A little bit later in the show, the hour, top of the hour, we'll be talking to George Soros, 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 who's bankrolling this entire invasion, invasion, invasion. It's Camp of the Saints all day, day, day on the Chapo Morning Zoo crew, crew, rock and roll. Bringing the caravan to you, you, you. Pepsi Max is the only sugar-free cola alternative that contains authentic baby parts. <laughs> We are here at Senior Frogs for the next 42 hours. Two for one cocktails for anyone who promises to behead a senior citizen once they get to the United States. 
Hezbollah-style terrorists are here with Al-Qaeda, with ISIS, with the drug cartels, cartels. There are no women and children in this caravan again. It's it is, just swole dudes. They're doing bl- reps. <laughs> They're <laughs> fucking taking steroids. We have the most powerful Muslims, the Shia division. They're doing pull-ups in covered wagons. There are no women and children. It's boys only. It's a nonstop caravan of a man cave. Dudes rock. More like a caravan. It's just for fellows. We will be coming soon before the midterm elections. 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 You cannot stop us. Us. Chapo Morning Zoo crew. 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 Coming up next, it's Led Zeppelin with the immigrant song ten times in a row. <laughs> row. 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 Okay, that was pretty good. When I started out talking about the the emotion that I've been feeling here being in this week, which is, you know, included doing things like looking out my window or brushing my teeth and then just starting to cry when I think about what's actually happening or what could happen here and just being here or uh, as part of this, I really feel like no matter what happens in this on Monday or in this election, and thankfully, uh, due to you know Alan Moore, I now have the philosophical and intellectual framework by which I can understand that anything that can happen already has happened uh, billions of times before. But but even if all free will is an illusion, we have no choice but to act as if it was not the case. We have no choice but to pretend. Or behave as if we do have a choice. You keep going. You keep, even if you, you think you're going to lose. You keep going. I can't go and, on. And no, I and go, no, must go on. No matter what happens on Monday and no matter what happens in this election, I can tell you that being on stage here tonight, for you, for my friends that are also on stage, for Bernie, is the privilege of my life. And we are gonna close. We're gonna close out the show tonight. You're we're, gonna help us. We are gonna close out the show tonight with this first time ever Chapo thing. We are getting dangerously into the territory of doing cringe. But if you're luckily, if you're us, you have accrued so many social credit points, you can indeed spend them a little on something like this. So we are for the first time ever. We're gonna close out tonight with the first ever Chapo sing along. And you guys are going to help us, and you're going to sing it with us. The song is one you might know, and it is the message of tonight and our theme that I've begun with, Solidarity. Solidarity! Right, don't, don't start it yet. Don't start it yet. Don't start it yet. Don't start it yet. Don't, don't, don't start it yet. Don't start it yet. Sorry. It's very fall on the bouncing ball. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Strong when the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet any forces on earth are doing weaker than the feeble strength of one, for the union makes us strong. Solidarity.